I welcome the Hearing Wellness Organization's instructional video on installing a home or office loop system. We'll be covering basic techniques to hide the wire to create the antenna for the system, to connect the system to your television or sound source, and to answer as many basic questions as we can. In a home with an unfinished basement or crawl space, one of our easiest installation methods will be to take the wire and staple or connect it underneath the joists. This will broadcast the signal up into the room, eliminating all of the obstacles in the room. You won't need to pull couches out, that kind of a thing. Makes it a very quick installation. We can then terminate that wire generally at the same location as the antenna or cable line that will come up and feed the TV signal in the back. When we're installing in a home and we have a carpeted floor, one of the things we'll do because there's padding here is we'll very carefully start to remove the carpet. I use, like to use needle nose pliers to start, but then I'll use my hands to make sure we're not damaging the carpet. We just want to get it up off of the tack strip. Here we can see the tack strip and the padding. That'll give us a path then that we're going to have the wire come across. Again with carpeting on the opposite side of the door, we'll get our carpet off of the tack strip. And then here we have our fish stick. Now I prefer fish sticks here as opposed to fish tape because the tape will curl. Where the fish stick, the fiberglass rod will go straight across our doorway. We want to insert it just inside of our tack strip there and just slide it across the door. You'll see it slides nice and easy. Just get it right across there. And then from the other side, be able to pull this back and with our padding, we'll see our fish stick is right here to go ahead and attach our wire to, be completely invisible and perfectly safe then as we cross this doorway. Once we have our fish line across, then we'll simply connect our fish, our wire to the fish line with a piece of gaffer's tape here. The type of tape is unimportant, just the connection here to make sure we're securely connected. We'll simply pull it across our opening here. And gently pull across. And here's our wire on the other side. Very quick and easy process. Where you have padding in a home carpeting, this process works very well and is very easy. In commercial carpeting, where we're going to deal with glued down, it's a different process and we'll talk about that later. We simply need to get the, the carpet reattached to the tack strip. This tool is called a carpet tucking tool. Cost about $7 at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's absolutely perfect. We'll get a nice push here against the wall. And then we'll take this in this fashion. And between the two, we're perfectly connected, 100% invisible, and we're all good to go. Again, when working at the home or office, one of the most valuable tools is this. This is a screen tool. It allows us to put the wire under a tight space without cutting it. These plastic wheels are very good to push without cutting. Here where we have a piece of trim up against the carpet, we can take our tool, push the wire in, and simply run it down the line. It is a very quick and wonderful way of doing it. No damage to the wall, no damage to the wire. Here again we have a home or office installation, but now we don't have a distance from our trim to our carpet. The carpet's tied up against there. So here what we'll do, we'll take a pair of needle nose pliers, we'll simply pull the carpet back. When it's glued down like this, we can work it again nice and easily with our hands, get it started. We can take our wire then and simply get it tucked in, in behind there. that's going to disappear absolutely wonderfully. When it's glued like that, it's going to re-adhere very nicely. If we need to, we can always use a piece of double-sided tape or some glue, but typically we won't need either. This is sufficient. One alternative to a floor level installation is being up in the attic or the ceiling. You want to be careful when you do that to keep the wire as close to the ceiling as possible and not up on top of you know, 12 or 18 inches of insulation. Certainly, the summertime is going to be a little warm for this kind of work, but it is another way to be completely invisible and inobtrusive to the room itself. Our alternative for installation of the loop wire is in a drop ceiling when available. This makes it very 
easy to do while maintaining an invisible installation. When doing this, always remember to staple or zip tie the line down and be perpendicular to the metal as much as possible. Try not to be in the tracks and keep our target height of 8 feet. can be extended a little bit, but not too much. One of the more complicated but very viable options when you're dealing with a concrete floor with glued down carpet on top or even finished tile work, that kind of a thing, take a saw, you can cut a groove in your concrete. Then within that groove, simply lay your wire in that groove, it'll disappear nicely. Then what you're going to need to do is just get some standard grout, pre-mixed grout, and when you put that on top there, you'll notice you get a nice smooth finish. It'll completely disappear for us. It's permanent. No fuss, no muss. This is going to be a, a bit messy, especially when you're cutting the concrete. The dust can be a bit much. Be prepared for that, but it is a great resource when that's the type of flooring you're dealing with. Ready? Yep. To make our connections then, one of the first things we have to do is strip the ends of our wire once we've gone around the room. Which is very, very gentle to do with these small gauge wires. We'll do that. We'll twist it together. Then we'll open up the back here, put it in, in our hole, and tighten it down. That gives us a good connection. Were you to connect this without stripping the wire, you will not have a connection and no signal. Again, we have our outputs on the back of the unit. Now we're going to use a digital coax. You can see the difference between the digital coax connection and the RCAs. RCAs are multiple. You have a red and a white for your audio. Here we have a single output that your digital coaxial will always be a single. In this case it's orange. Simply going to connect up here. When we go to the back of our unit then, we have our coaxial connection and we have a selector switch here. It was set to optical. We're going to slide that switch over to coax and we're going to take our coaxial and connect it there. Now we're connected. Again, in this case, we have multiple options for connection. We're going to use the digital optical. And using this cable, we'll take the cover off of the tip. That's simply a protective cover we must remove before connecting. Once that's off, we'll take this and click it in the back. Equally so for the back of the loop driver then, remove the cover and then simply square in to the top, put it in until it clicks. And now we're connected optical out to optical in on the loop driver. Again, our third possible output here, we have a line out with audio right and left. The yellow is for video. We won't need that. Here's our RCA connection, our analog connector that comes with our kit. We'll simply connect it here. Make sure our adapter there is good and tight. And on the back of our unit where it says line, we'll then take our 1 8 inch jack and connect in there and now we're connected. When we're considering installing a home loop system one of the most important things is going to be to find the television and look at the different audio connections. When we do that we're looking for something that says audio out. It's very important to distinguish the difference between an audio output and over here on the other side we see simply where it says audio. Audio over here is going to be an input, so we need specifically outputs. Here we have an analog, that's your red and white RCA connection, and then above that we have a digital audio output. They're always very specifically labeled. We also have a headphone jack there next to it that says audio. In each one of these cases we have an option. This is a rare TV that allows us to connect in multiple fashions. We can use either an analog unit and connection or the digital here. You can see there are many other connections here on the side of the TV in the back. These are all input connections. None of those would work for us. We need strictly the outputs. So this is a great TV for us to be able to connect to. We have lots of options. Another example of a flat screen television we have. As we come around to the back and look for the inputs here, we can see a far more common type of connection, and that is we have just a digital output here. As you look at the RCA connections, each one are inputs. The single output we'll find on this television is the digital audio out. This will require 
the in loop 600, or if you use an analog unit, this is an example of needing that digital analog converter. Here we have an older tube style television, and as we come into the back, you'll see many connections again, all RCA, but only one is going to be labeled audio out. This will be our target. In the case that those weren't labeled, we'd look for an owner's manual. If they don't have one, you can often go to the internet based on the television and model number, download one. For our older tube television, here's an example of what we've printed off from the internet to find where our connections would be. You can see a clear diagram here, and as it relates back to the TV, and then a description of what each one will do. The internet in this case has been a great resource to find these things, especially older televisions where it may be rubbed off over time or in some cases not labeled at all. This provides us that map of what we need to find out where our connections are. Here's an instance where if the TV's outputs are either taken or don't exist, we can come to a cable box and take our output from there. Again, you can see the RCA connections are going to be inputs. We look to our right of those, we'll find the digital audio output. Again, clearly labeled as an output. One more option, such as on this TV, again, we'll look to our labels. You'll see here's a headphone output. If that's our only available, we can take that, plug our 1 8 inch cable in, and get our connection over to our unit then, to our line input here. Always be careful with this choice though, as in some TVs, using the headphone jack may turn off the external speakers. In that case, you'd have to look back to your user's manual to see if you can override that feature or you may have to look at another option. When we're using an output source from a television, be it a headphone jack or sometimes even our digital outs, it's possible that may turn off the internal speakers. It's also possible that we may not have a good output signal. One of the ways we can verify that is take our MP3 player or telephone, use our 1 8 inch cable, connect it to the headphone jack in our phone, and play music. At that point, we can verify that our loop is good, we'll have a good strong output, we know the loop is right, the output is correct, we need to go back to our source, in this case the television, and verify that we're getting a signal out of that. Once we have our connections made, our loop run, we're ready to test and verify our signal. We have an IEC standard that we can measure the strength of the signal with our field strength meter. That lets us know that we've met those standards. However, in a home, the ultimate standard is the user's ability to hear that signal and know that it's good and strong to their satisfaction. For that, we'll simply turn it on and then verify with our loop listener that we have a signal. Once we've heard it, we can then make sure that they're in the right program, that their batteries are connected, those kind of things for their hearing aid to make sure we're in good shape. Once they get the big smile on their face, we know we've done well and the loop's great.